Good day, Bride of Christ. My name is Vilio, and I've had the privilege of being a part of Show for Stalin Vodge for the past seven years. Can you believe it? Time flies when you're having fun. And in this time, what a great opportunity we have to have online services and connect with one another on different platforms. Although we still want to say that we miss everyone dearly meeting together physically. It is so, so, so important to do so. Um, in this time, if you've just joined us, perhaps this is your first time streaming in with us, we want to extend a warm welcome to you. Um, we are really thankful that you have decided to join us on this day. There's a link in the description box. If you've got any ministry needs, prayer needs, we'd love to connect with you. Please fill that link in and we will get in touch with you. Now I'd like to ask Eva to share some announcements with us. Thank you. Thank you, Vilio. I'm so excited to see what God is doing in our hearts in this time, and I would love to share a few announcements with you. Firstly, we're hosting another live worship session this week, Wednesday at 8 p.m. It will be streamed on Facebook and on YouTube, so make a note and don't miss out. Secondly, every evening at 8 p.m., we have our daily encouragements. It will also be streamed on Facebook and on YouTube. We're finishing up with the Gospel of Matthew, and I'm so excited to announce that this Thursday, the 2nd of July, we will be starting with the Book of Acts. Thirdly, we are committed to seeing you spiritually grow, and that's why we have all these training schools going on. The Financial Wellness School is going at the moment, but we have two other training schools starting on the 6th of July, which will be the Apologetic School and the Our Father series. If you would like some more information or sign up for one of these schools, please follow the link in the description below to join the WhatsApp group. Lastly, we'd like to say thank you so, so much for all your contributions. It makes it possible for us to reach so many people in the communities around us and also keep the church and office going in this time. Enjoy the rest of the service. Hi church, it's Willem here saying hi all the way from Belleville CY. Clint, all the way from Wellington. Everyone, my name is Atengo Simpiti, coming to you from the Eastern Cape. Hello church, my name is Jürgens, I'm currently in Brackenfell. Hi church, this is Wimbai from Richards Bay KZN. Hi church, my name is Sean, I'm from Stellenbosch. This is Murray, in Tukhue KZN. Hi church, my name is Luke Langer, uh, I'm from Joburg, Bedford U. Hi church, Michaela from Durban here. Hi everybody, my name is Chris, I'm part of the Amplified Youth Group here at Stellenbosch. Hello church, it's Daniel Pasca here, greetings from the farm in Zimbabwe. So grateful for the response of the church during this time of lockdown of encouraging one another and caring for one another's needs. Hello everyone, my name is Kim Shaw. I want to say we miss you guys so much and we're praying for you. Missing you guys a lot. Um, I just want to say study hard, stay in community. Church uh, is how as small groups we've been able to continue to gather. I just want to say we're excited to see how God is waking us up to worship Him in spirit and truth. One thing that I'm thankful for about church is friendship and community to me is friendship. One thing I am grateful for the church is that they support us during this time when they are just like a family to us. This is my fifth time trying to make this video. <laughs> my English is not good. But yeah, I'm very thankful for the fact that we have community um, in church, we have a family. Um, and uh, one word that I would use to describe church is choir. Because of the choir, I get this picture of many voices, but they make one sound. Um, and I think it's, it's a similar thing with the church. Community is love. We miss you. We miss you. Can't wait to see you. Cheers. Um, and remember, we are the church. So remember that we are the church, we don't only go to church, so be the church. Remember, we are the church. I really hope to see you guys soon, we love you. Yeah, I'm really excited to see everyone soon, hopefully. Bye!
There is no greater glory, no more beautiful thing, no more majestic appearance, no commanding a king, no one we love. You are the one we love. And where the spinning heavenlies where they're crafting our hearts your word is potent in power you will perform all you ask you are the one we love Jesus you are you are the one we love and there's no greater love
perfect, spotless righteousness, the great unchangeable I am, the King of glory and of grace, the King of glory and of grace, the King of glory. Father, thank you that we are welcome in your presence because of what Jesus has done. Thank you that you invite us to draw close, to draw near. That you see us washed clean in the blood of Jesus. No greater love than this. No greater love. We celebrate, we remember your sacrifice, Jesus. We come boasting in nothing of ourselves, only what you have done. to worship together and uh, yeah I just want to want to thank James and the team for putting together such a great worship set and let's just pray together Father we just thank you for this time that we could spend in worship Father thank you for this evening that we can meet together uh, and receive your word via the internet Lord thank you that your word is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. And yeah, Lord, we just give tonight to you. We just give this evening the service to you. And we, we give you our hearts, Lord, and we pray, speak to us. Speak to us. Come and work in us. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Good evening, everybody. My name is George Lawrence. And I'm the Young Adults Pastor here at Shofar Stanabash. Uh, welcome to the streaming of our evening service once again. Uh, I'm really excited to share with you tonight. As you can see, um, I have not uh, visited a hairdresser yet. I am still contemplating if I should or shouldn't. Um, but it's great to be with you tonight. It's great to see what the Lord is doing and to share the Word of God with us. Just a forewarning, uh, there might be a baby crying or a dog barking in the background. Uh, please excuse if that does happen. Our baby is now just over three months old. So she's getting very vocal at this point in time. But let's, let's jump into it. The, the message that I have for us tonight and, and that I believe the Lord has for us all tonight is, and I've titled it Urgency and Obedience, and, and we'll get into that. Uh, as we go through and, and I hope and I pray that it'll become more clear what I mean by that but but let's start just with the central piece for this for this evening is Matthew 21 verse 28 to 32 and um, you can follow within your screen or open your Bible uh, Matthew 21 verse verse 28 I'm going to read through it and then we're going to jump into it uh, so it says what do you think a man had two sons and he went to the first and said, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. And he answered, I will not. But afterward, he changed his mind and went. And he went to the other son. There's another father. And he went to the other son and said the same. He asked him, go and work in the vineyard today. And he answered, this is the son answering, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said, this is the crowd said, the first. Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even when you saw it, 
you did not afterwards change your mind and believe him. So it's a it's a very, I think, simple parable that Jesus tells. There's a father goes to his two sons and the first he says, go and work in the vineyard. The, the, the son says no, but then he changes his mind or changes his heart changes and he goes to work in the vineyard. To the second son, he goes to the, says the same thing. And the and the response is immediate and it's yes sir I will go um, and unfortunately he doesn't go and then Jesus turns to the Pharisees or to the people that he's speaking to and he says you know what the the tax collectors and the and the prostitutes will go into the kingdom before you um, and and then we're gonna jump we're gonna get into that what that means but just some context for chapter 21. Chapter 21 in Matthew is, is an amazing chapter, beautiful chapter that talks about Jesus' tri triumphal, triumphant, triumphal entry into Jerusalem. So, excuse me. So, Jesus is, uh, he talks to his disciples, says, go get a donkey, go get a colt, bring it to me. He comes in, is riding into Jerusalem, and as he's riding into Jerusalem on this colt, on this donkey, he he sees the the people start laying their cloaks and and palm branches in front of him, and they start shouting, "Hosanna to the Son of David! Oh, save the Son of David!" And the cloaks were just like a sign in in that time of submission uh, to Jesus, and and the branches were like a, a Jewish national. Um, it was a sign of nationalism and also victory. So, so we get this idea that Jesus is entering into Jerusalem, and the people think, and or well, then they think, and their actions show that this guy is going to be the king. This guy is going to come and save us. In a sense, so so it's this triumphant entry that Jesus um, enters into Jerusalem, and and the next part of of chapter twenty one, Jesus goes into the temple, and it's this famous scene once again. Where Jesus bursts, or I can just see it in my mind. This is the picture that I have in my mind. Jesus bursts into the temple, and um, you can see he's on a mission because he, he just proclaims to the people there, tosses the tables over, and says, um, "This is supposed to be a house of prayer, and you've turned it into a den of robbers." And you know, I can think that this would have worked up the and and. and pressed certain buttons of the religious leaders and the Pharisees and, and also the people that were doing business there maybe. And uh, then we get to this to this part which I'm going to just zoom in on a little bit because I think it's important for, for what, what, what we want to get to is then Jesus curses the fig tree. So in your Bible you'll see there's these probably there'll be these little headings the triumphal entry entry uh, Jesus cleanses the temple. Jesus curses the fig tree. So in, in verse 18 and 19, I just want to read this piece to us. It says, In the morning, as he was returning to the city, he became hungry. And seeing a fig tree by the wayside, he went to it and found nothing on it but only leaves. And he said to it, May no fruit ever come from you again. And the fig tree withered at once. So there's this interesting uh, thing that Jesus says and, and he gets to the fig tree and, and, and says he found nothing but leaves and the reason why he says that is because a fig tree the leaves and the fruit come together that when there's leaves there should be fruit and he and he and he makes this and he makes his observation Jesus does and he says that there's only leaves there's there's no fruit and what Jesus is, and, and what this is alluding to is the hypocrisy of the people that say that they're following God, but there's no fruit in their lives of them following God. He says, I see only leaves, but no fruit. And then he tells the, the fig tree to wither. So there's an appearance of fruit. The bush probably looks beautiful, green leaves everywhere, but there's no fruit. And that's what Jesus is looking for. And that gives us a clue into what Jesus is saying in this in, in, in this whole chapter. And then it goes on and and then he has this conflict with the religious leaders. And and the the conflict is about is is Jesus from from God or or from heaven or from man? 
And so, so Jesus curses the fig tree, it withers, he goes into the temple, and the Pharisees ask him this question, by, by what authority do you do these things that you do? So just imagine in your mind that the religious leaders are already worked up a bit. He just went into the temple the previous day, threw everything over, told them it's a den of robbers, not a place of worship, kind of pressed the wrong buttons. Um, well, in God's eyes, probably the right buttons, but for them, not so great. And then, the, so, so they're irritated with Jesus. I can just imagine this. And he comes into the temple and, and they ask him, by what authority do you do these things that you do? And Jesus says, you know what, I'll tell you, I'll give you the answer to that question, but, but you need to answer me first. Was John sent from God or not? And, and, and in my mind, it's this little huddle that the religious leaders come into, Jesus on the one side, uh, the religious leaders here, and they get into this huddle and they're whispering, okay, and, and they have this discussion. Okay, if they say that John is from God, then they have a problem because why didn't they accept John then as a prophet? But if they say that John wasn't from God, then the people will probably overthrow them because the people truly believe that he was a prophet. And then they say, no, we don't know. They turn to Jesus and they say, sorry, we don't know. We don't know if John is from God or not. And in the question, Jesus exposes their dishonesty. He, he exposes them. And more than that which he exposes them, or in his ex exposing of them, he says, he's basically saying to the crowds, okay, if they cannot determine whether John the Baptist is from God or not, then how are they supposed to judge if I am from God or not? So with what authority do you blame or point at me, conspire against me that I am not the Son of God? So there's this, and, and, and I can believe that the religious leaders were really tense and really not in a good space at this point in time, because Jesus is really like on this mission to uh, expose them, basically. And then we get to the parable and it says, what do you think? Because this is Jesus' response. So they challenge him, his authority, and his response is, what do you think? A man had two sons and he went to the first and said, son, go and work in the vineyard today. And he answered, I will not. But afterward, he had a change of mind and went. And he went to the other son and said the same. And he answered, I go, sir, but I did not, but did not go. Which of the first, which of the two did the will of his father? They said, the crowd responded, the first. And in this setting now, they've just challenged Jesus' authority. He's just thrown over the, 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 his, the triumphal entry. He's cleansed the temple. And this is Jesus' response with the story. And I can believe everybody's following with, okay, okay, cool. And Jesus says to them, Truly I say to you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes go into the kingdom of God before you. For John, remember they just challenged him on, or he just questioned them about John. For John came to you in the way of righteousness and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even when you saw it, when you saw them believe, you did not afterward change your minds and believe him. Even when you saw it, you did not afterward change your minds and believe him. And Jesus just, he just keeps at it with these, with this interrogation or this um, exposition of this exposing of the true heart of the religious leaders and he's, and he's basically telling them you hypocrites you're like the fig, fig tree you have a lot of leaves and you might look fancy and you might look great but you have no fruit and you can feel the tension you know this is going down in the temple where the religious leaders are should be most at home this is going on in the temple and jesus seems to be on a war path Triumphal entry, cleanses the temple, curses the fig tree, just gets into like a flippin' debate with the religious leaders. And there's just this war path of correction and straightening out that Jesus is on. 
So, so, so Jesus is obviously looking to the religious leaders and he's saying, you know what? God asked you to take care of the temple. He asked you to lead the people to God, to himself. That, that's your job. Lead the people to me. Lead them in righteousness. Lead them in right standing to me. But you haven't done it. You said you would, but you didn't. You, there's no fruit. And you're just, you're just kind of living in this bubble of self-protection, of doing what is good for you. In the, in, in the, in just after that parable, there's a parable about the, the vineyard owner who hired it out, hired the vineyard out to, to uh, tenants. And they just used everything for their own gain and killed the servants that came to check and received the food, killed the son. And it's just terrible. And it's, and it's talking about the Pharisees who are in the religious leaders who are in the self-preservation mode. I'm just going to do what is best for me. That's the context that we find this in. But what does this mean for us? How, how does this relate back to, to us? And I think the place where I'll start is to say that, that all of us have this second son that says he will go but doesn't go inside of us. Especially when it comes to the word of God. We say yes, 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 but then, but then we don't go. And secondly, I think we all have in the same breath, we have a bit of this Pharisee, a bit of this religious leader in us. There's parts of us that just want to preserve ourselves. So we say yes to lead the people unto God or to do the work of God or to obey, but we just don't. We don't. And this is what I believe God's word is for us today. I've had this burden this week for, for two weeks probably now already that this is God's word unto us that he says, I believe this is what he's saying. I don't need urgency. I need obedience. I don't need urgency. I need obedience. And maybe maybe that hits hard to, to the gut, maybe it, it doesn't hit hard enough yet. But, but what I want to add to that is we find it all throughout Scripture. God saying the same message of, I don't want lip service, I want your heart. I don't want your garments, I want you to render your hearts to me. I don't want you to wash the outside of the cup. I want you to wash the inside of the cup. Excuse me. So show me your faith without works and I will show you my faith by my works. I don't want urgency. I want obedience. So don't hear what I'm, what I'm not saying. Urgency in itself is not bad. And, and let, me, let me explain it like this. That the, the prophet Hosea talks about fallow ground and fallow ground, breaking up the fallow ground. Fallow ground is ground that is worked and tilled and made ready to receive seed. But then in the end is never used and it gets hard again and is basically unusable in that state. So we need to break up the ground to use it again. And I mean, me and my wife, we had the same thing in our um in our garden last year, we wanted to plant a vegetable garden and we did the, you know, we, we, well, first of all, we actually, we tried to just plant the seeds straight in and nothing came up at all, um, which was a fail. And, and then we realized, oh, okay, like the ground isn't prepared. So then we prepared the ground and we added some compost and some potting soil and we readied the ground and then we got distracted and we didn't plant any seeds. And then when we wanted to plant seeds again, we realized, oh goodness, the ground is hard. It's unusable. And then we got Stefan uh, Diver in, in, to, to come and plant for us. And he was the one who actually broke up the ground, put the right nutrients in, planted the seeds and pff, fruit came from the ground. But we need to get rid of this fallow ground that is, that is in our hearts. We need to break up that which has gotten hard 
So if, if we look at the, the parable of the two sons, the bottom line is the one is doing the will of the father and the one is not. And the, and the, and the, the question or the, the, the statement almost that Jesus is making is, are you doing the will of the father? And if we're not doing the will of the Father, then we're in sin. And, and, I, and I just want to cover this very quickly, very briefly, that, that we find that generally there's two types of sin. There's sins of commission. And these are the things that we shouldn't do, but, but we end up doing them. This is things like lying, cheating, gossip, slander, envy, love of possessions, hypocrisy. And we, we find that these are the things that we... That we focus on quite a lot when it comes to sin. Don't watch porn. Don't lie. Um, don't commit adultery. Don't murder. Um, don't judge. Things like that. And the second sin, type of sin that we find is sins of omission. And these are the things. And, and this, this, this I think is what Jesus is getting to. Is the things that we should do. But we don't do them. And this is. This, this gets into like the heart of obeying God. That sins of omission are things like lack of love for God. Lack of love for our neighbor. Lack of love for reading the Bible. Lack of love for praying. Lack of love for the, 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 the poor and the needy and the people around us. And, and this is challenging. Because this is what Jesus is getting at. Is, is, he's not only saying, what are you not doing? Or what are you doing that is sin? He's saying, what are you not doing that is sin? We don't, he doesn't want us to be urgent. He wants us to be obedient. Another example, and, and I think this will help us also a bit in, 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 in what, I, what, what God is saying around urgency and obedience in Matthew 26 verse 30 to 33 we see it says and and when they had sung a hymn they went out to the Mount of Olives then Jesus said to them you will all fall away because of me this night for it is written I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered but after I'm raised up I will go before you to Galilee and Peter answers him, though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Peter, Peter says, though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Jesus said to him, truly, I tell you this very night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, and he, his response is, is great because we know the end of the story. He says, even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all the disciples said the same. And if you know the story, just as Jesus says, Peter denies him three times that night. And I think we have not only the, the, the second son, not only the Pharisee, but we all have a bit of Peter inside of us. We've, we, we're walking with Jesus and we're excited about what's going on. And, and, and Jesus says something or asks us to do and, and and yes yes lord they all going to fall away but this guy this guy is not going to fall away and his urgency faded when he needed to be obedient obviously it's a different story because jesus in in a sense jesus prophesied it and it, and it was and jesus can't lie but in that same sense don't we find it in our own lives that very often we are very quick to say yes. We're very quick to, to, to jump on this train of revival or of breakthrough. And we, I'm with everybody that yes, we want to see God revive us. We want to see revival come that the world would be saved. We want to see God's grace and mercy and love flow in our town, in our nation, in our church. We want to see it. We want to see revival. We want to see breakthrough desperately. And it's, and it's in this light that I believe God is like seriously wanting to penetrate our hearts 
and, and ask us the question, are we more urgent or passionate about revival than what we are obedient about seeing revival come? Because we can sing and shout and we can say that revival is coming as much as we want to. But if we're not obedient to the word of God, revival will never come. If we're not obedient to the word of God, if we're not obedient to the Holy Spirit and what he says to us and prompts us to do, we will not see revival come. And if you would stand up and you would draw a circle around you, just like a one meter circumference circle. That is where revival starts with you and with me. In my heart and in your heart. And as as we close, I want to I want to propose three things to us. That in instead of like Peter jumping up and saying, Lord, where you go, I go. I will not deny you. Everybody will fall away, but I will not deny you. Making these bold statements. I mean, I mean, we, we find ourselves so quickly. You know, we want these extravagant calls to go and be missionaries in the Republic of Iran. And we're like, yes, we'll go and do that. But, but we neglect to love our neighbor. We neglect to even know the names of our, name, of our neighbors. Me included. The people around us. So it starts with you. It starts with me. In my heart and in your heart. Breaking up the fallow ground. And the first thing that I want to propose to us. Is that in, instead of rah rah about passionate revival. Which we do need. We need urgency. We need passion. We need compassion. But it's going to come. That passion is going to come when we yield ourselves to God. And the word of God. And we start obeying the word of God. Firstly, I want to propose to us to start praying. Men and women Christians in our church, Shofar Stellenbosch, uh, I'm going to be very honest with us, is that we, we're, we're struggling to pray. We're struggling to get into prayer and, 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 and first of all, repent. Repent of the things that we don't do. To repent of the things that we do do, that we shouldn't do. Coming in repentance to God and Making sure that we're in right standing with God. Looking at our lives and saying, am I in right standing with God? Where are the places where I'm failing? And let's repent of that. Because just as Peter failed heavily, he was still the rock on which Jesus built the church. Because he came in an attitude of repentance. He came in humility. And secondly, in prayer, let us start petitioning for our town, for our family, for our friends. Let's start petitioning and crying out to God that God would come and intervene, that God would come and save. Let's start praying. The second thing that I, that I want us to do and to partake in is let us ask the Holy Spirit to revive our hearts again, break up that fallow ground to be obedient to God's word. Whether it is just something small like taking someone food who doesn't have, messaging someone who is discouraged, praying for someone in their time of need, sharing the gospel with someone, giving money to someone who you believe you need to give money to, you, there's conviction. Let us trust the Holy Spirit and ask Him to come and bring revival that we would be obedient again. Bring revival here. That that fallow ground, that ground that is unusable, those places in our hearts that is not ready to receive seed, that it would be broken up, that we can receive seed and be obedient to God's word. And thirdly, and I think this is so important, especially in this time, let us stir one another up, exhort and encourage, admonish one another to good works in obedience to God. Let us encourage one another to be obedient to God. Let's stay accountable to what God has called us to do. Let's stay accountable to what the word says. Let's not just talk about our feelings or theoretically talk about God's word. But what does it say? What can I apply? How should I live the word of God? And let's stir one another up to live out the word of God. I believe God's word for us Christian. Brother and sister in Christ, today is 
I don't want urgency. I want obedience. Because I, I believe that from a place of obedience, urgency will flow to see God's kingdom come. And maybe you're sitting there and you're like, I've, I haven't even committed to God. I'm backslidden, so far backslidden. I don't know how to get back. I have good news for you. Romans, the word of God, Romans 6 verse 23 says, For the wages of sin is death. These things that we were talking about, the wages of that sin is death. But, how wonderful is that word, but, the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. How do I receive that eternal life that is in Christ Jesus? Romans 10 verse 9 to 10. Because if you confess with your mouth, that Jesus is Lord. He is the one whom I submit to. He is the one who I fall under. And, and His kingdom, I live according to the, to the ways and the statutes and the principles of His kingdom. He is Lord. He is owner of my life because His way is the best way. If I confess, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, true faith, believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confess, confesses and is saved. I want to encourage you today that if you haven't made a commitment unto God, make a commitment unto God. The wages of sin, this way of the world, this way of our flesh, the self-preservation that we have, it doesn't work. It leads to death. But the free gift of God is eternal life. In Christ Jesus, would you confess with your mouth that He is Lord? Would you believe in your heart that He is raised from the dead? If you have made that commitment, if you want to make a commitment, you want to be followed up, you want to connect to a church body, there's a link in the description below. And you can click on and you can just fill in your details there. We would love to connect with you. If you have any prayer needs, please, um, there is a number that was in the... Um, in the announcements you can text that number or you can there's a link in the description below which you can fill in and we'll get to you we want to pray with you we want to connect with you i'm going to close off for us in prayer would you close your eyes and would you open your heart to receive what god wants to do father we thank you for your word today lord and we just say together with one voice lord that we don't want to be like that second son we don't want to say yes to your call, yes to your word, yes to your statutes and your principles, and then not do them. We want to we want to say yes to them and do them, Lord. Holy Spirit, would you come and break up that fallow ground in our hearts, that, that those places that are unusable, that are not ready to receive seed, that fruit can grow from it. Lord, we don't want to be like that fig tree that just has leaves but no fruit. Father, we want to be trees of righteousness that are planted by streams of living water that yield fruit in every season. Father, help us be obedient. Father, and in that sense, as we become obedient to your word, as we, as we surrender ourselves to you, Lord, would you come and bring revival, first of all, in our hearts? then in our, in our church, and then in our town, and in our nation. Would you come and stir us again? Would you lead us, Lord, to see people come to the knowledge of Christ? Would you see people saved and healed and delivered through your church, Lord? And we pray this, Lord. We, we cry out to you, Lord. We need you. We need you, Lord. And we say that we want to be obedient to your word above all else. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. May you have a blessed evening and I pray that the word of God would not only penetrate our hearts but would find fertile ground and grow and bear fruit from tonight.